you know, thank you again for the opportunity to present. Uh, so Javan and I are going to give you a little bit of a sense of what we're learning from our own research um, here in Ontario on who in the workforce may be most at risk of opioid related harms. Next slide. So the research that we'll be presenting today is the result of a collaboration between the Institute for Work and Health and the Occupational Cancer Research Centre at Ontario Health, both based in Toronto. So this research was made possible with funding by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And in addition, the Occupational Disease Surveillance System, which lies at the heart of this project, was established with the support of the Ontario Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, the Ministry of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development, and the Ministry of Health in, on, in Ontario. Next slide. So I first just also like to acknowledge that we do have um, a wonderful project advisory committee that has provided guidance to us throughout this project. Um, Carmine's on this um, committee as well. Um, so it essentially includes labor and workplace representatives, health and safety associations here in Ontario, uh, public health and substance use experts, as well as representatives from the Ontario Workplace Safety Insurance Board, which is the workers' compensation system here in Ontario, and the Ontario Ministry of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. So, you know, we're here, I, I think everyone is very well aware of the fact that um, North America has been facing an unprecedented public health crisis related to opioid related poisonings. And that's really worsened in the last several years, particularly since the pandemic began. Uh, the most recent data from the Public Health Agency of Canada suggests that between January 2016 and June 2023, there were over 40,000 opioid-related deaths among Canadians. The graph on the right shows the breakdown of those deaths by age and sex. So in this case, this is for 2022, although the pattern is generally similar from year to year. And what we see is that males of working age, particularly those between the ages of 30 and 49, have been disproportionately affected. And so given these demographics, given these particular age demographics, there's been greater interest in understanding whether occupation and the workplace environment have a role to play in why we are seeing these patterns. Next slide. Okay, so from a research perspective, I think most of what we do know about the role of occupation in opioid related harms have come from studies in the US. And so several of these have demonstrated occupational patterns in opioid related deaths. Across these studies, I've just presented a few examples on the left hand side. What we've seen is that um, opioid related poisoning deaths have been particularly prominent among those in construction and trades in natural resource occupations, in transportation and maintenance, as well as healthcare and services. And if you look, think about, you know, sort of the common thread across many of these occupations, many of them are physically demanding jobs. Next slide. So in line with some of these patterns, there is um, an emerging body of literature suggesting there may be a role to play for work-related injuries as a risk factor for opioid-related harms. So in this first study, um, what they found is that 57% of those who died of an opioid poisoning had a lifetime history of work injury. In another study, injured workers with uh, low back pain workers' compensation claims had a 62% increase in risk of dying from a poisoning compared to the general population. And finally, in the last study, Injured workers had a 79% increased risk of being diagnosed with opioid abuse, dependence, adverse effects, or poisoning compared to a, 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 a comparison group of non-injured workers within the first 36 months of injury. Next slide. So in Canada, on the other hand, we know relatively little about how this crisis has affected the working population, at least from a data perspective. So Carmine already showed a little bit of, of the data coming from this report of coroner investigations um, here in Ontario from 2019 to 2020. And what they found is that um, about 30 to 16, 13 to 16% of those who died were known to be employed at the time of death. And certainly this is not a trivial 
this is um, not a trivial proportion, but it's also important to note that among all opioid related deaths investigated by the coroner, about a third had an unknown employment status for which we have no information on history of employment and occupation. So there's certainly some data gaps there. Next slide. And this is the slide that actually that Carmine that, that Carmine showed. So that when we look at that group of about 13 to 16 percent that were known to be employed at the time of death, what we see is that most were employed in the construction industry. And this was consistent both pre and post pandemic. But again, it's important to highlight the data gaps. So even among those for whom we know were employed when they died, about 16 percent were missing occupation information. Next slide. So our project team has been trying to fill some of the knowledge gaps that we have on this issue here in Ontario by adapting an existing resource known as the Occupational Disease Surveillance System to monitor opioid related harms in the Ontario workforce. So the goal, um, the goals for today's presentation will be to present some of the findings of these analyses. In the first set, we've compared rates of opioid related harms among um, formerly injured workers in the ODSS to those in the general Ontario population. And in the second set of analyses, we've been examining whether there are occupational patterns in opioid related harms among these workers. We're also going to introduce the opioids and work data tool that we just released in December. So I'll turn it over to Jovanna. She'll take you through um, the methods and describe the results. Great, thanks, Nancy. Um, so I'm going to describe our sort of the methods and the occupational disease surveillance system known as the ODSS. So at the Occupational Cancer Research Center, we established this unique system, which we often re refer to as the ODSS, which has been used to identify and monitor trends in work related disease in Ontario, Canada. So the system was created in 2016 by linking existing provincial health databases with job information in order to study occupational disease and ultimately inform prevention activities. The ODSS identifies at-risk groups of workers. We can look at potential um, hazardous exposures within the workplace. And so far, the system has been successful in identifying many cancers and non-malignant diseases among workers in Ontario. The system contains about um, uh, information on about 2.37 million Ontario workers. And um, for this project, we use approximately 1.7 million workers, and I'll explain sort of why that is. Um, but the development of the ODSS was possible because of funding from the Ontario ministries. So for this project, um, the ODSS, which we also call a cohort of workers, includes occupational data on approximately 1.7 million Ontario workers. And workers were first identified in the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, WSIB, accepted lost time compensation claims records from 1983 to 2019. So the WSIB file contains information on their accepted lost time claim for a work-related injury or illness, um, and the claims information was transferred to the OCRC. And within this, we have sort of personal identifiers, um, their uh, work information, and also the workers' employment uh, data, such as their occupation and their industry. So this is really where we identify uh, the workers' employment information. And occupation and industry are reported in three distinct levels, which we often refer to as division, major, and minor levels. So at the division level, this is really our broad grouping of occupations and it's quite high level, but then we can dig a little bit deeper and look at sort of the major level, which is more intermediate, and then the minor level, which is the most specific job title that we can obtain. And because workers enter the cohort due to an accepted claim, we often refer to them as formerly injured workers. And these are the individuals who make up our cohort. So these formerly injured workers are then linked to a number of different databases. So they're first linked to the registered persons database, known as the RPDB in Ontario, which provides information on if an individual died or emigrated out of the province, along with any residential information. So the RPDB also includes all Ontarians that were um, registered for provincial health insurance. So each person is assigned a unique health insurance number. We then use this health insurance number to link workers to hospital records 
Uh, so um, such as the discharge abstract database listed there, which would give us hospitalizations, and the National Ambulatory Care Reporting System, which would identify um, emergency department visits. And so this is how we identify opioid-related hospitalizations and emergency department visits. Um, the reporting is from 2006 to 2020, so that's where we would be able to identify any of those uh, hospital records. And workers in our study are then followed uh, over time until they are diagnosed with an opioid-related outcome of interest or age 65 so that we can capture the working age group, death or immigration out of Ontario or the end of the study period, which is um, 2020. So here we present two types of opioid-related harms identified in the hospitalization and emergency department visits between 2006 and 2020. The first is opioid-related poisonings, which many uh, of you may have heard or referred to as overdoses. So poisoning can occur when an opioid is taken incorrectly and results in harm. And the poisonings can be differentiated by intent. So we're able to look at if these were accidental, in, intentional, or of unknown intent. And the poisonings that we're capturing can involve pharmaceutical opioids, non-pharmaceutical opioids, or a combination of both. The second opioid-related harm that we're sharing today our um, mental and behavioral disorders. And this includes a wide variety of mental and behavioral disorders that can differ in severity or clinical form. And some examples are withdrawal or intoxication, but they're all attributable to the use of opioids. And again, they may or may not have been medically prescribed. So overall in the hospitalization and emergency department visit data, we're able to identify about 10,000 cases of poisonings and about 11,000 cases of mental and behavioral disorders, all related to opioid-related harms. So I'm gonna present two different analyses in this presentation. So the first analysis is where we compare the risk of opioid-related harms among workers in our ODSS cohort to the general population of Ontario. So essentially we're comparing our 1.7 million workers to the general Ontario population to understand how does the risk of opioid-related uh, harms compare. So when we compare the ODSS cohort of workers to the general uh, Ontario population, we see elevated risks of all opioid-related harms among the workers in our cohort. So I'll explain what this means. So we use the standardized incidence ratio, which is a risk estimate, which will tell us sort of the, the risk of these individuals um, experiencing an opioid-related harm compared to the general Ontario population. And so when you see an SIR that's greater than one, this means that the risk of an opioid-related harm is elevated among the workers in the cohort. So we can see that when we look at the overall risk um, by the type of opioid-related harm, so poisonings or mental behavioral disorders, um, or if we look at the uh, data source, so emergency department visits or hospitalizations, we can see that the SIRs are above one. And for those who sort of understand how to read the risk estimates, these are all statistically significant. Um, so either way we sort of look at this data, we're still seeing an elevated risk among these formerly injured workers. On this slide, we're showing you sort of the comparison again, so ODSS cohort um, to the general Ontario population, and again, based on hospitalizations and emergency department visits. And what we're trying to show is these, where we see similar findings or elevated risks among, and which groups we see them in. And so this is our division level group. So the highest sort of broad categories of our occupations. And we already know that similar to our findings, the opioid mortality data primarily from the US has also found similar jobs characterized by high levels uh, physical labor to be at heightened risk compared to occupations where um, they're not considered sort of manual labor work. So as so shown, we can see construction and trades listed here, um, material handling, transportation, mining, processing, machining, we're all at an elevated risk compared to the general population. Two sort of other interesting groups that we see are medicine and service occupations. Um, so really the elevated risks among the med medicine uh, occupation workers are really sort of in the nursing occupations, so aides and orderlies. And service occupations are sort of a mixed bag, so it's a bit of a challenge to understand who, who makes up this group. Um, but where we see elevated risks are among those who are employed as chefs or cooks, bartenders, waitresses, those working in lodging and accommodation, 
and the managerial su and supervisor staff, and also janitorial and cleaning staff, among others. The second analysis that I'll go through in a little bit more detail to compare to what I just showed you is where we examine the occupational patterns of opioid-related harms among workers, again, within our ODSS cohort, but now we want to compare them to the other workers in the ODSS cohort. And this will give us a more comparable group. So for example, we're going to look at construction workers and compare their risk to all other workers in the ODSS that is made up of formerly injured workers, rather than the general population. So the results on this slide show you, again, the division-level occupational groups, so our high-level broad groupings, that demonstrate elevated risks of both poisonings and mental behavioral disorders um, across uh, the occupation groups. And so again, we see similar groups. We see construction and trades, um, a few others like forestry and logging, which weren't shown in the previous analysis, material handling, processing, and machining. Um, all were at higher risk of experiencing each of these harms. And given that in our study, we're able to look at a large number of workers, we can look at the study to dig deeper to understand what are the specific jobs within these groups that are at a higher risk compared to the other groups. Um, so you can see that overall, the findings are similar to the first analysis we shared. So whether we compare our, our workers to the general Ontario population or other workers, we're still seeing consistent findings. So we can dig a little bit deeper and look at the other groupings that I explained, sort of major and minor level groups, so to identify specific occupational groups within the broader contract, uh, context. So you'll see construction trades here, machining, transport equipment operating, which are the broad groupings. And then what are the groups within them where we see a higher risk or lower risk or no association compared to the other workers? Um, so within construction and trades, for example, we see elevated risks among excavating, grading, and paving, and other construction trades. So other construction trades include uh, workers who are employed as roofers or carpenters, for example. And then we also see a lower risk among some of the workers who are employed as electrical power, light, and uh, wire communication workers. And if we look at machining and transport as well, we can see that there's a, a difference in the risk across these job titles. And so, for example, in transport, we see an increased risk among water and motor transport workers, but then we see a lower risk or decreased risk in air transport workers. Um, so this is very important for our study because we have to be able to dig down to understand who are the workers that are most affected and which direction is their risk. So is it increased or higher risk, a lower risk, or do we not see any association at all? So as I just shared sort of the groups that remain consistent throughout our analysis, we also wanted to share some groups where there are mixed findings, or in other words, um, inconsistent findings. So these findings are specific to our analysis where we compare workers to other workers in the cohort. Um, and so what we're seeing here is at the division level, when we look at medicine and health, service, sales, or clerical work, we don't actually see an association at the broadest level. But what we do see is when we dig down deeper, um, again, this is where we're comparing workers to other workers in our cohort. We do see an increased risk across um, many of these jobs. So again, some of these similar jobs, nursing aides and orderlies, um, service again is a mixed bag. So we do see elevated risks among the janitorial staff, the food preparation workers, lodging or uh, other accommodation, um, personal services, which includes hairdressers and barbers. Um, and this is interesting because we don't see the associations of the broadest occupation grouping. But we did see this when we compared them to the general population of Ontario. And so again, we do share you know, some of these consistent results if we look at the, the samples by different analyses. And what's interesting is that as we dig deeper, we see that similar groups are elevated in both of these analyses. Um, so some of the other groups here, sales and clerical work, which is also a bit challenging to explore, um, are service station attendants, and tellers and cashiers. Um, so at this point, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of, sort of uh, share sort of a, a high level view of our results where no matter how we look at the data by data source, by type of opioid use, um, by uh, com the comparison group, so other workers or the general Ontario population, we're seeing consistent findings and elevated risks across the same groups uh, who are employed in Ontario. So I'm gonna pass it back to Nancy who's gonna talk about 
sort of the key messages and how to interpret our findings. Thank you, Giovanna. Uh, so Giovanna just took you through quite a few of the findings and I just sort of want to briefly summarize the implications of those results. So just to kind of go back a little bit to remind everybody, the group of workers that we examine in the study in the ODSS system are all, um, all previously had an accepted lost time workers' compensation claim for a work-related injury or illness. And when we compared this group of formerly injured workers to the general Ontario working age population, we found that the rates of our two key opioid related harms were significantly higher. And so the results um, lend support to this potential role for work related injuries as a contributor to opioid related harms, as we've seen in a few other studies. With that said, there is an important caveat. So at the moment um, in the ODSS, we lack data on actual opioid use. So we're only able to capture the harms of use, but we don't actually have data on, for example, prescription opioids. So what this means is that, you know, we don't know the source of the opioids leading to the harms that the workers experienced, uh, why they were being used, um, and when workers began using them. And so all of this to say is that we cannot necessarily attribute the opioid harms that we're seeing in this cohort of formerly injured workers to opioids prescribed for the work injury that got them into the cohort. The other, I think, key finding here, which is really consistent with the studies in the US, is that we do see that certain occupational groups are at a higher risk of opioid related harm. So they really tend to cluster in, in these among these certain occupations. And this was particularly true for occupations that we traditionally consider physically demanding. We can't say for certain why um, these are. We're gonna sort of talk a little bit about what those reasons could be but it certainly provides um, a signal for where we may wanna to start to think about targeting our prevention and harm reduction activities um, to really try and reduce those harms. Next slide. Um, so we've talked you know, um, already about that role of work-related injuries as a risk factor for opioid-related harms. And there are many reasons why this is plausible. So, I, I don't think I have to, you know, um, convince anybody here, but we know that work-related injuries, they result in pain, they result in functional interference. Um, oh, have we lost the slides? I think we've lost your, our slides, Japan. <laughs> oh, perfect, thank you. Um, so we know that they result in a lot of these sort of symptoms and, and it can make it more likely that workers are going to use opioids to try and alleviate those symptoms, particularly if they lack access to other pain management strategies. We can think about the fact too that poor mental health can often occur after an injury and the potential challenges of returning to work, staying at work can really make it more likely that a worker will use opioids. So. It includes things like pressures to return to work after injury, particularly if a worker, you know, um, lacks sufficient sick leave or their job is precarious. Um, we could think about if they don't have appropriate workplace accommodations, they may need to, um, you know, pop a pop a pill just to be able to get through the day. Um, and when we think about the fact that there can be many interruptions in in employment, so you know, returning, coming off of work, coming back that can really exacerbate poor mental health and can and potentially make it more likely that workers uh, will turn to substances to sort of um, cope. Next slide. Beyond, um, I think, the role for workplace injuries, there are other potential hypothesized reasons from a workplace perspective. So I'm only really focusing on the workplace piece for why um, we see that certain occupational groups may be at higher risk. I'm not gonna go into them too into too much detail, Carmine has already done, you know, a wonderful job of describing many of these issues and, and, and more. Um, but again, when we think about those occupational groups that we see in the US studies, the ones that we're sort of seeing here in our study, many of them are typically male dominated. Um, and that can certainly mean that, you know, gendered norms in the workplace about showing strength, about working through pain could be contributing. 
We also know that some industries and workplaces may be more normative when it comes to substance use in their workplace, or there may be other aspects of the work environment um, or about sort of the employment arrangement that could be contributing. Um, again, Carmine went through many of these things, but thinking about, you know, for example, things like the psychological and time demands of the jobs, how much control workers have over their work, how isolating um, the work is. Carmine sort of talked about, you know, uh, workers in the trades, maybe being away from family um, and the nature of the employment arrangement, you know, whether they're in, for example, in non-standard work arrangements. Um, and then again, we need to think about the role that concerns about disclosure may be playing. So workers may not be forthcoming, um, whether it be about their pain or about um, you know, any issues that they may be facing in terms of substance use due to concerns about stigma, but also the consequences that they may face at work if they do disclose that information. And I can, you could sort of think about how that could be particularly true in safety sensitive environments. And that can potentially exacerbate the issues that the worker is facing. Next slide. Um, so the results that we did present today are going through peer review at the moment, um, but they will be made available on our project website. I'll, I'll let you know about the URL in a moment. Um, once they do become available, we will have them on our project website. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, we wanted to sort of just let you know about a data visualization tool um, that we've created based on the data from this project. So the goal in producing this tool was to allow members of the public you know, particularly individuals and organizations that are looking for some data on opioid related harms from an occupational context to access information to better understand patterns of opioid related harms occurring among this group of formerly injured workers, as well as the characteristics of those workers experiencing harms. So the tool allows you to create graphs depicting opioid related hospitalizations and emergency department visits. Uh, that have occurred among workers in the ODSS from 2006 to 2022. We just recently updated the data to 2022. And there are three dashboards. So you can look at um, opioid related heart. We, you can look at um, data for poisonings, um, for mental and behavioral disorders, but also adverse reactions. And within each of the dashboards, there's a series of tabs that allow you to create custom graphs um, according to year, age, sex, region, and occupation and industry. Next slide. Uh, so we do have a project website, as I mentioned, the URL is listed here. Um, this is where, again, we're gonna be posting our research findings when they um, have gone through a peer review. Um, and this is also where you can find the tool. And so if I have a few minutes now, I'm just going to briefly take you um, through the tool. So we'll switch. Okay, so um, this is our project website. As I mentioned, when we have um, when our when our papers are published, you'll find um, they'll be posted here on in, under research findings. Um, but at the moment, what we do have is um, the data tool that's available. Um, at the moment, you can access it right on our front page or from um, this tab here. And so when you when you come to the data tool page. Um, it'll provide a little bit of a description about um, already what we've talked about today. What is the source of the data? Um, some of the considerations about using the tool. So again, thinking about the fact of who's in the ODSS, um, that's not a random sample of the Ontario working population. Um, the fact that we don't have data on opioid use. So that it sort of um, goes through some of that detail and gives some ideas about how the tool can be used and how you can um, share the graphs um, from the tool. Um, so there's different ways you could access the dashboards either on this landing page at the front um, as you scroll down, but probably the most e the easiest way is along the top. So again, as I mentioned, there's dashboards for each of the three opioid related harms that we've been looking at. Um, keeping in mind that adverse reactions is a little bit different. Essentially adverse reactions are um, when you experience uh, a reaction to um, an opioid, 
but you've been using it as prescribed. So it's a little bit different than the other two that we've been talking about today. So I'm just gonna give you an example. I'll click on the poisonings tab. Um, and so what you can see here um, along the top is that um, you can look at uh, the data on poisonings um, either over time. So this is our trends tab. You can look at it as um, the number of cases that we see in total, or you can look at it as um, in terms of the rates. Um, you can look at it with different filters. So you right now it's showing you the rate of opioid related poisonings for men and for all workers, men and uh, males and females for all ages in Ontario. And you can see the blue line here for emergency department visits and hospitalizations. But you can also, if you wanna look specifically um, at males, you can do that where males, for example, ages 45 to 65. Um, and you can also look at it within specific regions. Um, so for example, if we look at the central west region, um, you can look a little bit there. And there's more information, um, I should say, in terms of looking at, um, for example, who's in the central west region, um, you can actually look down here at our definition of key terms, um, where you can learn a little bit more about some of these um, groups, so health regions and our occupation and industry groups. But this gives you a little bit more, a few definitions um, for some of the things that you'll see here. So we also have a tab for age and sex, um, where you can look again at specifically what the breakdown of our of the opioid related harm is by um, here by sex on its own, by age, or by age and sex combined. Um, for those here in Ontario, this is probably um, the most um, this most applicable. Um, but again, here you can sort of look at where you can see some of the higher um, rates of um, either emergency department visits or hospitalizations across the province. Um, so. On the right hand side, you'll see it by you'll see um, the data by health region. Um, but here you can look a little bit more specifically at the public health units within those regions. Um, and if you hover over, you can see uh, what the what the data tells you. Um, if you actually click here, for example, on that central west, um, it will I won't try and zoom in. You can zoom in, but it'll limit the, the map to show you what public health units are in that particular region. And again, you can still sort of hover over to find the information for a particular um, public health unit. But probably the most um, unique feature of our um, data tool is the fact that we do have that occupation and industry information. And so the occupation industry tab look very similar. Um, so I'm just gonna sort of take you through the occupation one a little bit. But again, here, what we're doing is we're showing the, the cases and rates of each of our opioid related harms, in this case, poisonings um, uh, by division level occupation. So that's that broadest level of, um, of occupation uh, coding. And again, you can sort of on this um, left hand side, you can see where um, it's sorted according to what the highest, what, what occupations have the highest rates. Um, sometimes what you'll see is that there's some data anywhere where you see where data is missing. You may see breaks in, in, you know, for example, in the trend lines, or um, you may see missing information on the left hand side. It's because we have to suppress the data when there are too few cases. Um, so for, so we don't have very, we don't have enough cases in religion and uh, fishing, hunting and trapping to be able to report them. But again, you can sort of um, filter this tap, this um, graph on the left-hand side to look at, you know, if you want to look specifically at males, um, or even among or among females, um, you can look at specific uh, age groups, um, and you can again look at whether it's emergency department visits or hospitalizations. On the right-hand side. Um, if you wanted to look very specifically, you, what you could do is select a particular occupation group to look at the sex and age distribution of those who've been, who've actually experienced a poisoning. Um, so for example, I'll just select machining. Um, so what this says is that these are among those who've actually experienced an opioid related poisoning. We can see that 93% of them were males. 
um, and two thirds were between the ages of 45 to 65. And then again, at the bottom, you can sort of look at this um, age and sex uh, distribution. Specifically for poisonings, um, we also have a little bit of information on the type of opioid that was involved in the poisoning. Um, and this is sort of looking at the trend over time. And again, you can sort of change whether you're looking at the number of cases, whether you're looking at emergency department visits or hospitalizations, uh, the region. Um, and so here's an example of where you might see this break in the, in the graph. Um, so this purple line is meant to be opium and um, there's just not enough, there are not enough cases where opium was involved. So you'll start to see some of that data being suppressed. Um, but what you can sort of see here, if you hover over these um, categories, you'll see what they include. Um, again, so um, this yellow line is that um, that group that tends to be the more prescription type of opioids, the codeine, codeine, oxycodone, hydromorph hydromorphone. Um, and not surprisingly, what we do see is that um, the other synthetic narcotics tend to increase over time, and that group includes um, fentanyl. And then finally, we have an intent tab. So this is where in the data, they've coded what, what the um, what they believe is the intent behind the poisoning that they're seeing in the hospitalization and emergency department. Um, so it could be either accidental, uh, where the worker um, took an opioid, um, but did not intend to experience a poisoning versus intentional, um, where they were trying to, um, to, to be essentially poisoned by the opioid. Um, and then there's also a group where it's unknown. Um, and again, you can sort of look at this over time um, and, you know, with whether it's emergency department visits or hospitalizations. Um, if you, as I mentioned, there are some definitions of key terms um, at the bottom here. Um, there's also some, again, the considerations when using this tool. Um, you can also share um, in, a, in a couple of different ways. So you can um, use this sort of arrow down here to, to download a particular. So if you click on that, um, you can download um, whatever sort of whatever you're looking at um, on your screen what, with all the different filters. Um, so if you've chosen, for example, you wanted to look at um, the intent in the Central East region, um, you can download that particular graph. Um, and it downloads as either a PDF or a J, I think a JPEG. You can also share um, with the different um, uh, sort of icons below here. Um, although it doesn't give you the, it just sort of shares the, the a link to the tool rather than the specific um, uh, filters that you might have put on your graph. Um, if you do need a little bit more information to sort of understand, you know how to navigate the tool or to understand some of the terms, you know, what might fall, for example, within um, the different um, groups. So in service or in machining or, you know, you can get a little bit more information um, actually in our user guide. So if you click on that, it'll take you to a PDF um, and you can um, get much more information about how to use the tool and, and the data that's in the tool. Uh, and then finally, we do have a survey um, that we're hoping people will take to sort of just let us know how they're going to use the tool um, or how they think they might use the tool. Maybe you're not sure yet, um, but you know, if, if you're so inclined, it would be great. Um, you know, we would love to hear about how you might use the tool um, in future in, in your work. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we are, um, done and we're happy to take questions. Great, uh, that, yeah. that was awesome. Um, I love the interactivity of, of the, uh, the website and stuff. Um, Duane, I believe there's a number of questions for uh, both speakers, correct? Sure, the one that says uh, question for Carmen, for any of us to consider later, um, to help address the lack of continuity in construction workplace programs, illness, injury prevention, is it feasible to restructure the employer union em employment model? 
uh, permit, employment, longer contracts, etc., and or encourage interunion programming. Okay. Uh, so let me begin by answering it this way: a construction project has a has a, def, a definite start date and end date on a new build. So if the contract, if the building needs to go up in in three three years, no, it's based on the actual uh, contract, how long it's gonna take. Maintenance, maintenance is even worse because if Carmen goes into OPG to do a shutdown, you can't have that, if it needs to be done in 14 days, they will get it done in 14 days. And what that means is those workers are going to be working up to 80 hours a week consecutively. So it's really hard to, to change the process. What they could do, if they sequence work better, all right? So you don't get into the situations that projects get made. And what I mean by that, you go out on site, you're say you are doing piping. And you want to get it done so the pipe fitters on for, for say, the, the life of the project is eight months and a maintenance, and the piping should only take three to four weeks. Make sure that you can sequence it, that you have the appropriate resources, i.e. the materials, that you have your engineering drawings are right. If you do it that way, then you may be able to mitigate some of the stressors. But actually changing the nature of work, it's going to be really, really difficult. Okay, I think that answers it very well. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah. Um, I do have one now, and I, I'm not really sure who it's for. Is the data in the tool only associated to RSIs, or does it include other work-related conditions? I'm assuming this is for the the uh, the last one, last presentation. Uh, yes. So, um, Tavana, you may. I'm not sure if you'll have a better sense, but I, if they're not, um, they're not specific, they're not just RSIs. Um, I don't remember offhand, but I would say that the vast majority, um, were sort of the vast majority of workers in our sample do tend to have those sort of physical, uh, musculoskeletal, um, type of injuries. Um, but it's not exclusive to that. So we do have some workers in our sample who have other. Uh, work-related um, illnesses and diseases. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I would like to remind you all to please uh, complete the uh, Slido survey before you leave. At the same time, uh, a reminder, we have it up on the screen of the next three-week sessions, and I just posted a link to uh, the registration if you haven't signed up yet. Uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to be uh, Bringing you some more very interesting topics, accumulating uh, on February 29th, which Catherine said is the official RSI day. Uh, so again, I hope you all register, and we look forward to seeing you all again next week.